Hello, good evening. Well, hello, Oklahoma. I am uh, so humbled and honored to be here today with all of you. And uh, this is my second time in Oklahoma. The first time I came, I actually was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it was, believe it or not, three days after the horrific election that we went through in 2016. So you could just imagine how kind of on the edge many of us were. And I walked into this banquet hall um, where we were celebrating uh, the Council on American Islamic Relations Care. Uh, they were having their anniversary banquet in Tulsa. And I walk in and I'm like, what are all these white people doing here? And I wasn't really sure. I, you know me, I gotta, I gotta ask questions. And I walked in and it was the most magnificent thing I've ever seen in my life. And it moves me every time I think about it. It was families, moms, dads, grandmas, children holding up signs saying, Muslims are welcome. Oklahoma loves you. Refugees welcome here. We stand together. We are one Oklahoma. And it was the most inspiring thing that I had ever seen, and especially in light of the election that week. So shout out to Oklahoma. That was, the, that was my first impression when I met Oklahomans. So I just want to say um, Thank you to the MSA here at the University of Oklahoma. And I made sure to say that correctly because I, I didn't want to offend you by mistakenly calling you Oklahoma State University. So then, you know, I heard there was a rivalry. I was like, this Brooklynite is not trying to come here to get in trouble. But thank you to the MSA um, and to Adam and, the, and my friends at CARE here in Oklahoma and for all the work that you do. Uh, and all my friends from Oklahoma who came out, including parents of my favorite libertarian, Adam Bates. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Nancy and John. Anyway, sorry. Um, I'm just really um, humbled to be here. And I'm here, you know, a lot of times people invite me to events and, and I know that there's a reason why. I think uh, I bring something and a perspective that I think people need to hear. And I'm from Brooklyn, which is a very important part of my identity. And the reason why Brooklyn is so important is because it kind of tells you a lot about me. In Brooklyn, those of us born and raised and bred Brooklyn, we don't have filters. We don't know how to reframe and frame, and we don't know how to find the right words to make people comfortable. It might be the water that we drink, which is really good water in New York City. But it's like, we just tell it like it is. We say it like it is, and we hope that it lands the right way, but it always doesn't necessarily land the right way. But, so bear with me. Keep Brooklyn in the back of your mind. Sisters and brothers, what a time to be alive. And I reflect on this every single day, that here we are in 2018, and the types of conversations that we're having, the fights that we're having and continuing to have. And when people ask me, so what do you think? And I think that this past year, I would argue, has been one of the most remarkable years of my life and also one of the worst years of my life. And one of the reasons it's one of the most remarkable years of my life is I had the privilege and honor of being one of the co-chairs of the largest single day protest in US history, the Women's March on Washington. And Believe it or not, in 2018, when we had the first year anniversary of the Women's March, in many states around the country, many cities around the country, the actual marches were larger than they were in 2017. So what we do know is that the resistance is here, it's strong, it's flourishing, and it's being led by women. Now, it's also been the worst year of my life. And when I took the stage in 2017 as a Palestinian Muslim American woman in hijab, a woman who was able to help organize and mobilize people of all backgrounds to come together and say that we stand together, that we stand against racism and xenophobia and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and against sexism and misogyny, there were some in our country that just couldn't handle it. I was too much. And they couldn't fathom to see a strong and bold Palestinian Muslim American woman in hijab who was speaking truth to power no matter the consequences. And they literally were like, how dare 
she smash every stereotype and propaganda that we've been propagating against Muslim Americans in this country. And we've been doing a really good job for the past 16 years. And here comes this lady, antithetical to everything that we've been saying about Muslims. And so what they have done in the past year is that they have continued to slander me, consistent attacks, defamation of my character, threats to myself and my family. And I stand here before you today a little bruised, my feelings are hurt sometimes, I'm offended every other week, but I'm still standing and I will not be silenced nor intimidated by those in my opposition. And, and for people who kind of watch what happens to me, and in particularly in the online space, they ask me all the time, they say, Linda, I don't know how you do this. I don't know how you wake up every morning with all this hate and vitriol and the things that people say to you. And just for folks who don't know, I'm actually a mom. I actually have a son who just started his first year in college. I have a daughter who's a senior in high school who right now is getting acceptance letters to college. And I have an eighth grader. So not only am I exposed to this type of vitriol, but imagine children who are not living in caves who are on social media and have to read such horrible things about their mother. But the reason why I still stand is because this experience and how I explain it to my children, that this experience just reinforces everything that I have learned about how history teaches people who stand for what they believe in and speak up against the status quo and for justice for all communities. And I reflect that this year is the 53rd anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X and Hajj Malik Shabazz. In fact, he was assassinated on February 21st, which was only a few days ago. This year is also the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, which will be on April 4th of this year. So much to reflect on. And before I take you on a journey about how history teaches us what people in our country has, have had to sacrifice for equality and justice, I want to first root you in the moment that we are in right now. When people ask me how am I feeling, I'm going to say the truth to you all. I wake up every morning in perpetual outrage. I go to bed in perpetual outrage. It's only been a year since this administration has come into office. And I know many of you are here because you're following what's happening, but just so we can all be on the same page and be rooted together at the atrocities that are happening on our watch in 2018. Here we have an administration that rescinded DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, putting almost 850,000 young people in our country at risk of deportation, and by extension, 12 million of their undocumented family members. We have rescinded temporary protective status for Haitians, 60,000 Haitians, many of whom have been in this country for 30 and 40 years. We've also rescinded 200,000 temporary protected status to people from El Salvador. We also have changed the mission statement, apparently, of the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. So the, the agency right, that, that gives out visas and works on immigration issues took out from their mission statement that we are a nation of immigrants. The USCIS took out that we are a nation of immigrants from its current mission statement. The constant attacks on our health care. And twice the Republican Party has tried to strip us of our health care. And they failed. So what did they do? They thought it was a good idea to fold in the repeal of the Affordable Care Act in a tax bill. And they ended up succeeding. And all of you and me can argue about the Affordable Care Act from here till next week. But I will tell you that I was in Washington, D.C. just a few weeks ago during the passage of this tax bill, where I stood right next to people in wheelchairs, people with terminal illnesses, women with cancer, 
others with pre-existing conditions, including my dear friend, brother, and union organizer, Adi Barkin, who suffers from ALS. And people stood there, Occupy style, protesting the tax bill. And I remember very vividly this woman, who was in her 40s, had a bald head from radiation and chemotherapy. And I remembered her saying this. She said, I am here today because I want to live. And it was such a profound statement for me, thinking to myself that I live in the United States of America, the land of abundance. And here is a woman saying that she may lose her health care, which in fact means it's a death sentence for women like her. And at that moment, I was so ashamed to be an American and know that there could be thousands of people who could die on our watch just because they don't have access to basic health care. In the past year, the constant attacks on women and our reproductive rights. Just recently, this past week, the vice president, because he ain't my vice president, the vice president, Mike Pence, said, abortion will end in the US in our time. I don't care what your position is on abortion, but I hope that we can agree that no government, and especially not one where 80% of them are men, should be legislating what we do and what women do with their bodies. <laughs> Muslim ban one, Muslim ban two, Muslim ban three, now we're at the Muslim ban four, which is pretty much Muslim ban one. <laughs> I mean, I can go on. We dropped the mother of all bombs on Afghanistan this past year. We killed 200 civilians in Iraq in the deadliest airstrike since the war began in 2003. We have a misinformed president, a dangerous president, who thought it was a good idea to stand up against the international community and declare Jerusalem the capital of Israel and move the embassy, the American embassy, to Jerusalem. This one in particular, just in case it's not clear, I'm Palestinian. And since our president thinks it's just a, as easy as a declaration from a man who lives on the other side of the ocean, I will stand here before you and declare that Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. Now, the mass deportation forces are out. They show up at courthouses. They show up near schools where people are dropping off their children. They're attacking immigrant rights activists across the country. You watched it in the media. And most recently, they deported a Palestinian immigrant named Amir Adi, who lived in Ohio, who has been living in the United States for 39 years, is a prominent business owner, an asset to his community, a friend of everyone in his community, and was deported back to Jordan leaving behind an American citizen wife and four American citizen children. Indictments and charges against half the administration. A sexual predator in the White House, and we can meet too all day long, but if you can't hold the man with the highest office accountable for the acts against, that he has perpetrated against women in this country, then we have to find a new path for this movement because it is hypocritical for us to stand up against powerful men and leave out the President of the United States of America. Now, I say all these things to you, and I can list many other things, but I think that that's enough for us to understand that we're living in some pretty horrible times. And I think, regardless of what side of the political aisle we're on, I think we could all agree that this has been one of the most unstable, inconsistent, dangerous administrations that we have ever had. So let me go back to the anniversaries that I talked about earlier. And this is what I've been reflecting upon this week. I've been re reflecting, especially in the past month when I watched people, all kinds of people, reflecting on the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, in January, we all have a day off of work. And what always was interesting to me, and I don't know if this has ever caught anyone else's attention, I always thought it was really interesting and mind-boggling 
that everybody from the conservative right, I'm talking about all the way to the right, and then all the way to the left, literally falling off the spectrum, and then everybody in, the, in between was like quoting Dr. Martin Luther King. I was like, how is it possible that all these people who disagree on everything else happen to be in agreement about this one man? It just makes no sense to me. And then I realized that history lied to us, that we have a very flawed understanding of who Dr. Martin Luther King was. And I want to remind everybody here today that I stand before you as a 37-year-old Muslim American activist. And when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated, he was 37 years old, assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, standing with workers who were on strike. And what people want us to believe about Dr. Martin Luther King is that he was this peaceful man who brought black people and white people together, which is why so many people embrace him. But in fact, that's not actually who Dr. Martin Luther King was. He was a black radical revolutionary. He believed in basic human rights for black people. His mission was to ensure that black people were treated the same as white people in America. He was a victim of police brutality. He wrote you letters from the Birmingham jail. J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director at the time, called Dr. Martin Luther King one of the most dangerous men in America. The organizations that he organized with were blacklisted by the US government. So I always wondered to myself, so why is it that 50 years later, here we are saying what a wonderful man Dr. Martin Luther King was? And I think if more people learned and understood the history of these United States of America, we would have a better understanding of understanding this particular moment that we're in right now. You know, what I also learned about history, and I, it allows me to reflect on someone like Malcolm X. Now, we can argue that Malcolm X was probably one of the most hated men in America. But he was also one of the most respected political and historical figures in these United States of America. So my question to myself always is, do I want to be the most loved and praised person in America? Or do I want to be a respected person for someone who stood very strongly in my convictions and principles and values? And I think on this one, I've decided that I'm with Malcolm X. I don't mind being the most hated woman in America. According to Tucker Carlson on Fox News, I am one of the most dangerous women in America. And you all got to watch out for me. Now, the reason why people like Tucker Carlson say things about, like that about me, they call me anti-American, I'm not a patriot, is because we also don't seem to have the same understanding of some terminology. So for example, this word patriot gets thrown around a lot. And oftentimes, the way patriots are depicted are some guys with some cowboy hats waving around some American flags. They might be patriots, I don't know. But when I think of a patriot, I think of myself. I think of people who do not sit back silently in the face of injustice. When I think of a patriot, I think of someone who loves their country so much that they fight every day for their country to be better. Now, the real reason why they call me anti-American is because they say that, you know, if I don't like it here, I should just go back to where I came from. Just to be very clear and to be on the record here, I'm from Brooklyn, born and raised in Brooklyn. Nowhere else to send me, got nowhere else to go. But really what they want me to say is they think that because I'm so critical of the US government and because I stand up against injustice, that somehow I took for granted that my Palestinian immigrant parents chose to come to the United States of America to choose a better life for me and my siblings. I don't take that for granted. I know many immigrant families do not take that for granted. They fled political persecution, religious persecution, war and conflict, poverty. There are many reasons why many immigrant families chose to come to these United States of America, and I don't take any of that for granted. 
But just because I don't take that for granted, and just because I've had better opportunities than I would have otherwise had living under military occupation, I also am rooted in the reality of the country that I live in, which is why I'm an activist and an organizer. And what people don't like is when I root them in the reality that we live in a country that was founded on the extermination of indigenous people. This is not my opinion. This is a fact. That we're also a nation founded on the enslavement of black people. This is not an analysis that I came up with over the years. This is a fact of the matter that we forced Africans, 25 to 30% of them, by the way, were Muslims. We stripped them of their culture, of their homes, of their families, and we forced them here in free labor to the United States. When the Muslim ban was happening and people were talking about the Muslim ban during the elections, people were like, Linda, they can't do that. It's unconstitutional. But I reminded people that we live in a country that passed a piece of federal legislation called the Chinese Exclusion Act. We can do these things because we did these things. We excluded a whole group of people from a country from coming here. We're also a nation that has the capability of deporting millions of people at one time. Operation Wetback. We deported over 2.2 million people back to Mexico. Now, mind you, majority of those people didn't cross the border. The border crossed them. So we did that. So when people tell me we don't have the capability of doing mass deportation, I said, not only did you do it on Operation Wetback decades ago, we did that under President Obama. President Obama deported more immigrants than any other administration before him. So just because I would be quite happy to have President Obama back now, it doesn't mean that President Obama was a perfect president. So then we went to, we talk a lot about refugees and welcoming refugees. I don't forget that in the 1930s, we literally rejected boats of Jewish refugees and sent them back to Europe. We sent them back to death and destruction. I believe that we too, as the United States of America, were complicit as we turned a blind eye to what happened in the Holocaust in Europe. We did that. We also interned Japanese Americans. We did that on this US soil, in these United States of America. In 2018, we will all argue that we ended slavery. We just call it something else, just to make everybody feel better. It's called mass incarceration. Sisters and brothers, did you ever think to yourself, how is it that we are not the most populated nation in the world? How is it that we hold 25% of the world's prison population? How is it that we, the United States of America, hold one out of every four prisoners in the entire world when we're literally competing with countries with a billion people like India and China? You know why? Because in this country, we figured out how to profit off the prison system. So these nice clothes we wear, these products that we use, got to be careful. There are people getting paid 12 cents an hour to make the clothes that we wear and the products that we use. And I will argue with you all that that is modern day slavery in 2018. Now, all these things that I listed, and I could list a lot of other things, but I think you get the point. And the reason why I'm an activist and organizer is because I don't want to have to wait until there's another atrocity against another community. I'd rather organize and build and build allyship and solidarity and bring people together so that we can prevent atrocities from happening on our watch. The thing that speaks to me the most as a Muslim American is Japanese internment. And another anniversary that just came upon us on February 19th was the anniversary of the signing of Executive Order 9066 by President Roosevelt, which began the internment of Japanese Americans. Now, the internment of Japanese didn't happen overnight. It wasn't like a one-day thing where a guy woke up one morning and said, I got a great idea. 
why don't we just go around and, 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 and capture all the Japanese Americans and put them in, on these camps? And another guy was like, what a great idea, let's do it. It's not how it happened. It was years and years of propaganda against Japanese Americans. What did they say about the Japanese 75 years ago, now 76 years ago? They said the Japanese were not to be trusted. The Japanese were the enemies within. That the Japanese did not have the capability of being loyal to these United States of America. So we had to protect ourselves from our Japanese American neighbors. So what did they do? They went around to the homes of Japanese Americans. They took their, them and their children, including a very dear friend and mentor of mine, Congre former congressman now, Mike Honda. So the fact that there are still people who are alive today that experience Japanese internment tells me how close in proximity we are to potential atrocity. And the reason why Japanese internment speaks personally to me as a Muslim American is I think to myself, who are they saying that about now in 2018? You would literally think that somebody picked up the same playbook. The Muslims are not to be trusted. The Muslims have a secret agenda to take over America. Islam and the Constitution are incompatible. Muslims don't have the capability of being loyal to these United States of America. Muslim loyalty lies in some faraway land. And they've had 16 years since the horrific attacks of 9-11 to put these thoughts in the minds of the American people. And you know what? The election of Donald Trump proved to me that that propaganda worked. And that a lot of the reasons why people chose to vote for a man like Donald Trump, because Donald Trump was very clear during his campaign that the Muslims were the enemy and that he was gonna do a complete shutdown of Muslim immigration. He said to the people that Islam hates us. He was very deliberate in how he sold his platform as an anti-Muslim president. And then when he became the president, he literally put every single person that I and the Council on American Islamic Relations have been working against for the past 16 years, leaders of America's most notorious hate groups, people in the media from the right wing that have been using their platforms to defame and slander Muslims and gave them highest offices in the land. Some of them are fired, some of them have resigned, which is a good thing. But the fact that they even got to the White House tells me that we're going towards a very dangerous moment. Now, It's important for this moment, because a lot of times I hear people talking about the civil rights movement, like now everyone's gonna be commemorating the anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, which is important. But I hope that as we reflect back at the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, that we're asking ourselves right now, in this moment, who are we right now? And I remember this one kid, actually a Muslim student, uh, at, the, at, a, at a university in the Midwest, in Ohio, actually. And I went to do a lecture similar to this one, and at the end there was question and answer. And this Muslim kid stands up in the audience, and this is a room a little bigger than this one, and he was so passionate. And he said to me, Sister Linda, I want to ask you a question. I want to know who lived in these United States of America at the time of Japanese internment. I want to know who those people were that allowed for their Japanese American neighbors and their children to be picked up and put in camps on this US soil. Who were those people? And he abruptly sat down. And I was so moved and I, my, he took my breath away. And in fact, I didn't have an answer to his question. And I remember a few days later, I'm sitting in my office in Brooklyn, New York, and it came to me and I heard his voice. And you know what I said to myself? I said, I know exactly who those people were. They were the silent majority. Sisters and brothers, I am pretty positive that there were people 75 years ago who were sitting around saying, this is horrible. This doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel right. We should not be doing this to our Japanese American neighbors. But what they did was, is when they looked out of their kitchen window and saw law enforcement agencies hauling these people off, what did they do? They closed their blinds and went back to their everyday life. So I ask people all the time, in this moment, who do we want to be? Do we want to be a member of the silent majority? 
or do we want to be a very loud part of the very loud resistance that you see right now, which I will say is still in the minority. And what I will say, and what I had said later on to some of the young people, is I said, I don't really care what people think about me right now. I don't really care what people have to say about my work. What I will, what I will know and what I do know every night when I go to bed is I sleep well at night. My career has been dedicated to standing up for all marginalized communities. And most recently, I had another moment to reflect on the way in which we choose to show up in moments. And I want us all to reflect. And as someone from Brooklyn, I, I do provide some uncomfortable truths, which is why there's some opposition to the things that I have to say. I've been watching the beautiful resistance coming out of Parkland in Florida. I'm so moved and inspired by those young people. And I truly believe, and I'm one of those people who believe that most of the movements that we are so proud of historically have been led by young people. But I'm not gonna lie to you, I still have something inside of me like that's conflicting, and I don't know if you share this with me. I was watching these kids in Parkland, and it took me back. It took me back to 2013 when Trayvon Martin was killed by George Zimmerman. And you know why it took me back to that day, and I'm going to tell you why. I had the privilege and honor of spending time with a group called the Dream Defenders. And the Dream Defenders was a group of high school kids and young college-age kids that were so outraged by the murder of Trayvon Martin and the acquittal of George Zimmerman based on this very flawed stand your ground law in Florida. And these young people had a mission. And their mission was to repeal the stand your ground law in Florida. So a whole bunch of black kids, they were like 98% black. What did they do? They took over the Florida state capitol for 30 days. Literally, 24 hours, they slept at the, at the they, they were occupying members of the state legislator's offices, the governor's office. They were literally sleeping and camping for 30 days, taking bird baths in the bathrooms of the state capitol. I went there and slept on a cold, tiled floor with these young people. And I, I, I can't help but think, where was the support for the Dream Defenders? Where were the millions of dollars to support the efforts of those young people that slept 30 nights on the Florida State Capitol? We were too busy having a conversation about what kind of kids they were. Were they worthy to be activists? Could we actually believe that young black people can bring transformative change in our country? So I hope as you show support, and I want you to show support with all that you have to these young people in Parkland and young people rising up across the country for gun reform. To not forget that those most disproportionately impacted by gun violence are black and brown people and have been directly impacted by gun violence. So as we move through this time, sometimes even the best of us, even as they say the most woke of us, has to challenge our own biases and wonder why we show up for some in some way and don't show up for others in a different way. And it may be something that's subconscious. You may not understand why. And actually, you may be thinking to yourself right now, I really never thought about it like that. Because in this moment, we got to show up for all young people. And we cannot leave any young person behind, whether it's a dozen young black people that got shot in Chicago or it was 17 beautiful young white folks that were shot in Parkland. All life is sacred and valuable, and that's the kind of country that I'm fighting to live in. Now, I think we have a lot of work to do right now. And I don't like to wait and see. That's just not the kind of person that I am. 
And I actually remember people in the Muslim community right after the elections were telling me, you know, Linda, this might not be as bad. Just got to give the guy a chance. He's never held elected office. You never know. That's just not how I operate. I'm a worst case scenario person. That's how I operate. But I also found it interesting that after the elections, which speaks to also the way that I organize, it was really interesting to me. Like everybody woke up the next morning, or at least everybody that was in my circle, woke up the next morning in despair. People were so outraged. I'm not going to lie to you, I was outraged too. But I was outraged for a different reason. I was actually outraged at the outrage. And I was thinking to myself, is it possible that Donald Trump actually introduced racism to everyone? Sexism and misogyny and xenophobia to everyone? Homophobia, transphobia? I was really dumbfounded that it took the embodiment of one man to actually remind us of all the fights we were already having. We were already having fights for immigration reform. We were already having fights and calling on police accountability and law enforcement accountability. We were already working against sexual assault in college campuses and in the military. We were already and continued to fight to keep Planned Parenthood open and fighting for our reproductive rights. The fights were the same. We were already out there. But I was like, you know what? Maybe we needed Donald Trump. And I know that's not a popular position to have. But as an organizer for the past 17 years, I said to myself, hey, if we had to elect an American fascist for everybody else to wake up and find out that we were not actually living the dream here in America, then Donald Trump is more than welcome. <laughs> but now that he's here, now that he's here, and we're all awake now, I really am asking you to do a few things. And I'm an organizer, so I don't like the theoretical lectures, right, and the people trying to analyze the world around you. I want you to actually go home and actually have things to do. So here are the things that I want you to do. I want you today to commit to not being part of the silent majority. I want you to commit to never being a bystander. I also ask you to show up. Sometimes we underestimate the power of the individual. And I always think back to the Women's March, and I always wonder, what if half those women that came to Washington, D.C. said to themselves, you know what? No one's going to miss me at the march. No one knows I'm coming. I'm just going to decide to go somewhere else. Guess what? We wouldn't have had the largest single-day protest in U.S. history. So your individual participation at a local rally at an interfaith, at a vigil, one plus one plus one plus one plus one is mass mobilization. So do not underestimate the power of the individual. This year is a very important year. And I want to be real clear with people. And for those who may consider themselves to be part of the political left, because people think that I only criticize people in the right. No, actually. It's very clear to me that I may never get on the same page with them. But in the political left, we're also not on the same page. And we have a lot of self-righteous politics. This year, 2018, is a very important year. And I'm asking you, if you are not registered to vote, register to vote. And if you are registered to vote, I want you to register again. The reason why I say that is because people are like, what are you talking about, Linda? I'm registered to vote. They get to the polls in November. Linda, my name wasn't on the road. They, didn't, they couldn't find my name. Registering again just updates your current registration if you're already registered. So register to vote. Make sure you're registered to vote. And then the most important part is what? I mean, come on, people. It's pretty simple. So let me just explain that a little bit, because a lot of people would say, Linda, I don't know if voting is the pathway to liberation in this country. I don't know if that's really what's going to free the people. You may be right, but what I will tell you about voting is this. It will alleviate suffering in the interim. I'm going to be brutally honest. I was a national surrogate for Bernie Sanders in the 2016 primaries. I'm very proud of that and still proud of that.
And I'm not usually inspired by old white dudes, but I was inspired by Bernie Sanders' platform. I was like, wait a minute. It's not really that far-fetched for us to believe that we, we are worth access to health care for everyone and access to free public college education. Like, I don't know, there was just, I was like, that sounds pretty basic. Anyway, we lost the primary. Things happen. I don't want to get into the details, but we lost. When the general election came up, and many people know this, and I'm very clear about it, I personally wasn't a fan of Hillary Clinton. That's just my personal opinion. But you better believe that I was in the state of Ohio, up and down the state, that was my, that's the state that I chose, working to ensure that people voted for Hillary in the primaries. You know why? Because it wasn't about Hillary Clinton for me at that moment. It was about a collective vote against fascists, xenophobes, Islamophobes, anti-Semites. And it was a vote for black people. It was a vote for undocumented immigrants. It was a vote for LGBTQ communities. It was a vote for Muslims. I was thinking about the most marginalized people and how, in fact, a Trump administration would, would further marginalize people already marginalized. So this wasn't a personality contest. It was what was at stake at that moment and I knew that what was at stake was important enough for me to put my self-righteous personal politics to the side and ensure that Donald Trump was not the president of the United States of America. But I guess I couldn't convince a lot of self-righteous people, and we found ourselves in a very grave situation on November 9th of last year. Voting. The, this is another thing that I need you to do. Everybody in this room can do it. Don't tell me I'm a student, I'm a struggling student. I saw Starbucks on your campus, and I'm sure that a couple of times a week you stroll in there for a latte. I know studying is hard and you want to take your mind off of things. I'm asking you to donate $5 a week to an organization that is local in your community that is doing work that you care about. Forget the big people. Forget the big organizations. It's the organizations locally who are working on reproductive rights, working on refugees and working with asylees, people working with undocumented immigrants, people working with trans youth and youth of color, or any organiza organizations working on healthcare research, whatever it is, I don't care what the issue is, something that you deeply care about. $20 a month goes so far for a local grassroots organization. Imagine a local group that can find 50 people that can give them $20 a month. You paid their rent, their electricity bill that month. So don't underestimate the power of consistent giving and choosing an organization. How do you do it? Give up a latte a week. I'm serious. When, I, when somebody said that to me the first time, I thought it was crazy. But then I was like, you know what? Wednesdays, I won't have a latte. And that $5 is going to go to one of my favorite organizations. So, 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 so give. One of the most important things that I'm also going to tell you to do is you got to be well informed. And I'm not trying to say that I'm on the side of Donald Trump, but sometimes even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> There's a lot of fake news out there. There really is. And sometimes I watch very intellectual people sharing articles with clickbait headlines. And then I look at that article and it's like Breitbart.com, Daily Caller, Daily Stormer. I can go on. I memorize like all Algeminer. Like I can sit here for days and name all, all that. They've all written about me, so that's why I know them. If you're going to share information, number one, make sure it's a credible news source that you're sharing. That's number one. Number two, also corroborate the information. There, how many people have died and came back to life? Because you found one article online that some guy died, like some celebrity died that we find out they didn't die. It's because you just found one article and you went to share it and then we just passed this rumor all over the world and it became viral. Same thing in organizing work. We don't want to scare immigrants when you see an article saying mass deportation forces out in Tulsa, Oklahoma. If you don't have anything to back that up, you probably don't want to scare people in your community. So make sure you're corroborating information. Make sure they're credible news sources. Make sure there are at least, one, at least another news source that is corroborating that information. And don't share you know, alt-right media. Just don't do it. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. They're, they're not credible news sources. And the reason why I say that is because in this movement, in this time that we are in, knowledge is power. And we can only act on actual facts 
and some of the new sources that I recommend, like if, if the Associated Press is saying it, if Reuters is saying it, you know, me and the New York Times go back and forth. You know, we're not always friends, but you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, even your local papers here, credible journalism with some integrity. The last thing that I'm going to tell you to do is the most important thing for me. So all those things are very important, but this is super crucial and the most important thing that you can do. I always think to myself, what if people 75 years ago had very deep transformative relationships with their Japanese neighbors? Like what if their kids played together, right? What if they shared dinners? What if they broke bread together? Right? What if we picked up, they picked up each other's kids and sent each other's kids to schools, maybe babysat for one another, you know what I mean? Real, actual, transformative relationships. Do you think that right now, and I think about this myself, I have a neighbor who's undocumented, and she has four daughters. Her husband is disabled. And I know her very deeply. My daughters play with her daughters, they go to the movies together, um, they come to, they do sleepovers at my house, you know, like, I know them, like, I really love them like I love my own daughters, right? And I always think to myself, what if one day ICE agents came to my neighborhood and came to my street and I find out that they're taking my neighbor and her beautiful four daughters and her disabled husband? I know without a hesitation in my heart that I will walk outside of my house and I will stand between them, between the ICE agents and this family, because that's the kind of relationship that I have with them. So what I'm asking you to do in this room today, and something that we have lost as a country, especially in the age of social media, go home and knock on your neighbor's doors. Do you know your neighbors? Do you actually know your neighbors? Do you know their names, the names of their children? I know people that work in companies that told me, Linda, after you said that, I thought to myself, you know what? Every morning when I walk into my office, I actually pass by three cubicles and I don't even know the names of the people sitting in those cubicles. If we are going to protect one another, we have to know one another. So in your school campus, at your work, in your neighborhood, just go up to people and say, hey, my name is Linda. I'm your neighbor. By the way, I work in this cubicle just down the hall from you. Just wanted to introduce myself. Hey, I'd love to get some coffee with you sometime. You know, just have some casual conversation. Go to your neighbor's house, three doors down. My name is John. I'm your neighbor, three doors down from your house. Just wanted you to know I'm around. If you need anything, feel free to knock on my door. Here's my cell phone number if you ever need anything. Especially if you actually know there's a refugee family or an immigrant family in your community, uh, you know, maybe a single parent, anybody. Just being able to tell people that you are here for them means the world to people. And it creates a type of resilient community. And for me, when people say sanctuary city, I don't think of, about sanctuary cities in the way that you hear them talk about it on national television. A sanctuary city for me is not a policy. It's a mindset. It's a way of living. It's a way of being. Do we commit in this room to being part of communities that are safe for all of us? And that is what a sanctuary community means to me. It means that we have all committed to that, that every family that lives with us in our neighborhood, that take their kids to our kids' schools, that we all have the right to live freely and safely in these United States of America. And I will encourage all of you by saying this, and I said this earlier, don't worry about what people say about you now. And I know a lot of people sometimes they're a little apprehensive or reluctant to get into organizing work because they're like, Linda, look what they do to you. Look what they do to prominent activists. First of all, no one's asking anybody to be a prominent activist or do this for a full time. Just do whatever little bit that you can. But I will say this to all of you, and in particular those of you who are part of clubs on, on college campuses where I know it's hard to organize. And in particular, I want to give a shout out to those of you who are organizing with Students for Justice in Palestine. Do we got them in here? I know that the resources are limited, and I know a lot of times people will, will say the very, our very being is, 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 our very existence is controversial. And you know what? They said that about college organizers who were organizing around South African apartheid many decades ago. 
They called them controversial. They had opposition. And guess what? They organized. They continued. They were consistent and were able to lead the movement to end apartheid in South Africa. So in the movement for racial justice and economic justice, for immigrant rights, for LGBTQ rights, there's always been a fight. There's always been opposition. And let me tell you this, if this work was easy, if being in the resistance, if being an activist and organizer was easy, guess what? Everybody would be doing it. But everybody is not doing it because it's hard work, it requires thick skin, and it, it requires very deep convictions. So I, I am imploring all of you to find a role, find some way to participate. Go to a rally, go to a march, show up, donate, vote, and let us protect the most marginalized amongst us. And then hopefully in 2021, we get our act together and we actually elect a president that we all deserve. Thank you so much to all of you for having me here today. Most of the questions relate to, that came in from uh, the audience, relate to Islam. So I'll hold those, but I want to ask one uh, question first. Uh, there were two. One of them I think you've answered pretty thoroughly. Uh, what drives your activism? I think you've explained that, but you can uh, elaborate if you wish to some more. But uh, a non-Muslim uh, question is, what did you gain or learn from working as the co-chair of the Women's March? Is this mic on or is my mic, is this mic on? Can you hear me? Okay, you can, you can stay there. Um, so the first question, and I kind of said this earlier, but what drives my activism? I'm Palestinian. It's really in my blood. I, I have a lineage to an oppressed people. It's what my parents taught me. I'm very proud of my Palestinian heritage. Um, so I, 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 I like was born fired up. The second, the second, <laughs> The second thing that drives my activism is that when you see me, I hope that you don't think that I'm an activist despite my religion. I'm actually an activist because I'm a Muslim. And I believe wholeheartedly, and I believe wholeheartedly that Islam is a religion that is rooted in social justice. And that is an, it's an anti-racist religion. We reflect the diversity literally of every racial background, every ethnic background from every corner of this world. And I truly believe wholeheartedly, uh, contrary to the belief of those in the opposition, that my beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, he himself was a human rights activist. And I follow in his footsteps to stand up for all of God's creations. And when we say all, God created all people, regardless of who you are and who you choose to be. And that is why I am an activist. Now, because I am going to do some real talk, when people saw the Women's March on Washington last year, everybody during the march and after the march were like, wow, how impressive was that? Largest single day protest in US history. But what I realized as one of the co-chairs of the Women's March is that I learned a lot. And so did a lot of other people who were involved in the Women's March. And one, something that is very important that happened is that Originally, when the, when the march started, as you know, it was a Facebook page that was started by some white women. And those white women could have had their own march, and it would have probably been fabulous, and they would have probably bought millions to the streets. But if we would have let the white women go ahead without women of color, yeah, if we would have went ahead without women of color as part of the organizing of the Women's March, it would have been missing a lot of people. And, one, and I'll give you an example. Issues of reproductive rights, or when we say things like equal pay. Equal pay means different things to different women. So for example, when, we, when white women say equal pay, a white woman doesn't get paid the same as a white man. But a black woman doesn't get paid the same as a white woman. 
and an immigrant woman doesn't get paid the same as a black woman. So this racial justice analysis, this racial analysis needed to be brought into the Women's March. Also, the prioritization of issues. We cannot impose on women in America, all women, that reproductive rights is the top priority issue. Because if you went to south side of Chicago and you asked the black mother, what is your top priority issue? She will say to you, I want my son to come home to me alive every night. If you asked an undocumented woman from Ecuador, what is your top priority issue? She'll say to you, I want to be able to come home from my factory job without being stopped by ICE and deported and separated from my children. So we and the Women's March were able to have open, constructive conversations that were intersectional and inclusive and gave entry points for all people to see themselves in the larger platform of the Women's March. So Muslim women saw themselves, black women saw themselves, trans people saw themselves. There were many mistakes we made along the way. But for an organization or for a, for a group of women ad hoc to put together a type of intersectional platform in the way that we did in nine weeks, for me personally, was hard work and hard labor. And I have to give kudos and credit to the women of color who centered the most marginalized communities and to the white women who were open and open-minded and open-hearted and said, you know what, this is my time to step back, my time to learn, and my time to understand what those around me have been suffering all these years while I turned a blind eye. So that's what I learned from being the co-chair of the Women's March. As uh, you know, Oklahoma was the first state to pass a referendum about eight years ago now uh, to ban Sharia law uh, <gasps> and, and all international law. Uh, so apparently we can't do business with Sweden anymore either. So it was a pretty comprehensive, poorly written uh, law. 70% plurality. Uh, and now over 20 states have introduced some kind of legislation or initiative. This seems to be uh, an issue that sticks at least with a number of people what is Sharia law, and what do you think people are afraid of? Uh, help explain that phenomenon, if you would. So first, Sharia means law. So technically, when we say Sharia law, you're saying law law, but anyway. <laughs> so I actually got caught in a controversy about this, which is why I'm happy to answer this question. At the same time, eight years ago, when um, the Oklahoma state legislator was trying to ban Sharia, this really monstrous thing, um, I was in New York City and we were basically having, we had a social media campaign trying to basically explain what Sharia was and so I got into controversy at the Women's March because then these um, trolls went back eight years ago and pulled out tweets out of context and sequence because that's what they do. Um, and you know, and I don't care, it's fine because I still stand by all the tweets that I put out. But anyway, what's important to understand about Sharia is that Sharia basically is a, the pathway for Muslims to live out their lives, right? So it's very similar to, to halakha in, you know, for those who are Jews and similar to canon law. The interesting thing is that the Islamophobia, Islamophobia industry in this country has been really good for the past 16 years in trying to define what Sharia is. So how do people figure out what Sharia is? They go online, they Google an image, an infographic shows up, and it tells you Sharia law is stoning women, Sharia law is all these really bad, horrible things, right? It's ahistorical, it takes things and quotes from the Qur'an out of context. And in fact, as someone who is a, you know, a doctorate of Islamic studies, we can argue the same things that people will say about Sharia, we can say about the Bible, like things that are found in the, in the Torah or the Bible or the Qur'an is pretty similar. But this constant obsession with Islam is what really bothers me. So Sharia is a very th simple thing. It's, it's, it's the ways that we get married. It's the way that we divide inher inheritance when people in our family pass away. It's how we arbitrate all divorces, you know, things like that. It's about praying five times a day. It's about fasting 30 days. It's all kinds of, you know, almost like rules and regulations of like how to be a Muslim. Not everybody follows all of them, but the point is that's what it is. And I want to just give a, a quick story that relates to Sharia to another word that's really scary to people. Like literally when people hear this word, like their knees shake. Sharia is one of them. The other word is jihad. I know everyone's like, yup. And there are, by the way, there are Muslims named jihad and that really, like I got a special soft spot for those people in my heart. <laughs> 
So let me tell you a really quick story. I went, so the word, the word jihad translates to struggle. It could be all kinds of struggle, but the actual word translates to struggle. I think as an Arabic speaker, I should be the one to define what jihad means and not Google, which is not Arabic, right? Just making that clear. Anyway, I went to a big Muslim convention just this past year. And I went to a, a Muslim banquet. I did a keynote speech and I, and I was trying to like motivate these Muslims to you know, organize in the resistance. And I said to them that there was a story where a man asked our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, what is the best form of jihad or struggle? And then our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him, responded and said, the best form of jihad or struggle is a word of truth to a tyrannical ruler. That's it, right? Right, that's what happened. Everybody clapped, it was great, chatted with some folks, then I went home. The next day I wake up and I'm trending on Twitter. And Donald Trump Jr., the, the son, now this is how crazy this is now, listen to me here, the son of the President of the United States of America was calling for my arrest for treason, for calling for a holy war against the President of the United States of America. I swear to God, I, I, if, go Google it, I'm telling you, it was, it was horrible. Every celebrity all right personality in America was going after me online, I was getting death threats, people were doxing my home address, it, went, it was crazy. The reason why I share that story is because I had a choice to make at that moment. There were people in my community that were so afraid for me that they actually called me and said, Sister Linda, you gotta be careful. You can't be just saying these kinds of things. And I listen to these people because they have my well-being, you know, like they have my best interest at heart, and I know that, they're good people in, inside. But then I decided to do something. And what I decided to do is I, saw, I decided to double down. And I called the Washington Post and I said, look, I got some stuff to say, you gotta give, I got, they were like, write whatever you need to write, let's go with this. So I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post, go read it, and it was about jihad. The reason why I'm telling you this is because I want you all, especially those in the room who are non-Muslim, we as Muslims do not tell Jews how to practice their religion in this country. We do not tell Christians how to practice their religion or Sikhs or Buddhists or anybody else from any other faith tradition. And in that moment I decided why should I allow anybody else to define how I choose to practice my religion freely as long as I am not engaging in violence or inciting violence against any communities. And why, do I, why will I allow people who are clearly anti-Muslim to define my religion for me. How is someone who's anti-Muslim going to define what Sharia is or what Jihad is or what other concepts in Islam are? For me, I drew a line and I said, you know what, it's not happening on my watch. And I'm going to defend my right in this country to be a full Muslim and I also have the Council on American Islamic Relations who's going to defend my right to be a full Muslim in these United States of America. So, if, if if there, are if there are questions that you have about Islam, if there are things, I don't want you to be shy. I don't want you to feel like questions are inappropriate. I love when people ask me questions about Islam. Is it true this? Is it true that? What do you think about this? That's cool. If you want to know about Islam, it might make sense for you to ask a Muslim. That's my, my advice. Let me, let me add on to that question just another little piece, and that is uh, Islam, Islam is clearly not monolithic uh, any more than Christianity or any other religious Absolutely. tradition. So when people see uh, the extremism, say, of the Taliban uh, and extrapolate from that, uh, then I think that creates part of the dynamic that, gets, that, that people feed on because it's taking something that's on the extreme. It is an interpretation, but certainly a very extreme one that most Muslims don't embrace uh, at all. And so just to remember that uh, Islam, no more than Christianity, uh, is a monolithic tradition. There's a lot of different ways people interpret. And particularly, I think what I'm hearing you say is that people latch on to the most extreme sorts of things, something somebody in ISIS does and gets attention, and paints the whole picture based on that. That's, that's, yeah, that's def I mean, that's actually exactly what happens. But what really make, what's, what, what's so like dumbfounding to me is we actually don't do that to any other religion. Ku Klux Klan, right? White supremacist groups that are rooted in some sort of ver version of Christianity, 
No one, no one ever says, you know, this guy who went to this church that went to the church in South Charleston and shot nine people. No one was like, we got to go. Where's his church? Where's that press conference? Who's condemning these acts of terror? Even historically in this country, Ku Klux Klan, they were lynching black people. No one asked the whole Christian community to stand up and, and, and condemn the acts of this particular Christian. Even in Africa, Christian militias, like I can take you for centuries of crusades and other things that have happened and colonization and imperialism and things that were done in the name of other faiths. But this obsession that for some reason when a, a, a person that is a Muslim does some sort of act of, of violence or terrorism, somehow 1.7 billion people around the world have to all stand up and we all got to be like, he ain't with us. <laughs> like, it's not even logical. Like, it's actually quite ludicrous when I think about it. So I just wanted to put that out there. It was just a therapy moment for me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Related to that question, uh, two questions. Let me combine them. Uh, some people in the U.S. Uh, see or say that the hijab is a symbol of oppression. How do you respond to that? And related to that, how would you explain or what would you want to say about gender dynamics in Islam to a non-Muslim? I mean, do I look oppressed to you? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know how to... Yeah, sorry. Um, you know... What I think is really interesting about this hijab question is that somehow there's some forces out there that are trying to impose on us that a piece of cloth defines whether a woman is oppressed or not. And that really never made sense to me. I choose to wear hijab. But I also stand with women in Iran who are forced to wear it, right? So they're taking off their hijabs because they have mandatory, right, compulsory, whatever they call it, hijab, that they force women to wear hijab. But just because I stand against mandatory hijab doesn't mean that I'm going to say that hijab is a form of oppression because it's not true. Governments forcing women to wear hijab is not equivalent to saying hijab is oppression. That just doesn't make any sense. So the same way, and I've been very vocal about this, the same way that I stand with the women of Iran who are protesting mandatory hijab is the same way that I stand with Muslim women in a country like France who has banned people from wearing burkinis on beaches, who doesn't allow women to wear hijab in public universities and public sector jobs. So you believe it or not, we can hold both of those positions. And somehow somebody wants me to choose. No, hijab for me personally is part of my identity. It is part of who I am. I feel very empowered that I get to wake up in the morning and choose to cover my hair while, an, while my sister doesn't cover her hair. And that is her choice that she doesn't cover her hair. My hijab doesn't define my capabilities. I can do anything that any other woman can do. And I think we have to separate what we watch dictatorial regimes doing to people on the other side of the world and actually give back agency to women millions of women around the world who choose to wear hijab. Do not take our agency away from us, just like we will not take agency away from women who choose not to wear hijab. On the question of gender dynamics, it's all about culture, and for some of us that come from certain parts of the, of the Arab world, and for me there's a lot of things that people pinpoint about Islam that bothers them, and I don't know why it bothers you if you're not Muslim. It doesn't bother me. So for, I'll give you an example. People are always wondering, and they say, you know what, Linda, it really bothers me that when you go to the mosque, that you either don't pray in the same room as the men or you pray behind the men. Why are you so outraged about that? There's a reason, there's a logical reason why women pray behind men. In fact, it's actually to protect the women. It's actually the reason why is for us to center and to respect the right of a woman to be able to pray in safety and not feel like she's being judged or being you know, treated in any other certain way. Why? Because in Islam, the way that we pray for folks who have ever seen Muslim women pray, we prostrate, we bend. There's no reason for me to feel comfortable. No woman in this room would feel comfortable with rows and rows of men behind her, 
bending over, over and over during prayer. So, so the, the reason why I say that, and it's really funny because I've had this conversation so often. And I said, I'm, a, as a Muslim woman, as a quote unquote feminist, I'm all right with that. I understand the logic behind it. And I'm able to go and pray in mosque in, in tranquility. I don't have to worry about anything that's happening around me. So that for me, you know, there's some men and women who, for example, don't shake hands. If a man prefers not to shake my hand, that's cool. That's okay. Some men do, and it's also to your point, doctor, that it's not monolithic in the way that we share in gender dynamics. I personally, for example, do shake hands with, with, with men. That's just how I culturally grew up in the family that I was from. But all I say to people is just don't be judgmental, right? Let people practice their religion in the way that they want to practice it. And if they're comfortable with that type of gender dynamic, we should be okay with that. Just like we should be okay and to consent whether a man touches us, Muslim or not. There's sometimes, there are people who come up to you and want to hug you. Some people don't like hugging. Some people don't like people touching them. So Islam, we take the shortcut, right? By default, touching is not a thing that we do. So I personally, I mean, I'm not an Islamic scholar, but I have come to terms with the logic behind a lot of things that people criticize from the outside in the way that we interact in the Muslim community. Thank you. Uh, for the non-Muslims in the audience, how can we be effective allies for our Muslim neighbors and friends? So I want to offer another word to you. Is that cool? So I get really uncomfortable with that word ally. I want you to be an ac accomplice, <laughs> literally. And let me tell you why. Because allyship only takes you to a certain level. An accomplice allows you to be just a little bit uncomfortable in whatever it is that you're willing to do for those who are most marginalized or those who are, you are willing, who, are, who you want to build a relationship with. So for example, you know, I love when people come to the mosque to provide solidarity. Let's say there's a protest outside and people come and stand in solidarity with that particular community, right? It might take a little bit more for you to potentially join an effort at the mosque to serve some refugee families and be an actual accomplice with that community to serve the most marginalized amongst them. Sometimes it's going to require for you to defend the most marginalized. And it might mean that you engage in an act of civil disobedience. It might come to a time where you may have to actually go outside your home and, and stand in between a law enforcement agency and your Muslim neighbors or your immigrant neighbors. So for me, I'm asking for your allyship to make you just a little bit more uncomfortable, get you to a point where you feel like you have to give something up. So activism right now, if you're not giving something up or you're not feeling a little uncomfortable with what you're doing, you're just not doing it right. It's just not enough right now. We need you to do a little bit more. So get out of your comfort zone, join us as accomplices, and I promise you, 40 years from now, all of us are gonna be walking down Colin Kaepernick Boulevard. And there might be a, a, a boulevard named after somebody in this room. Well, I'll give you two quick examples of things uh, in a number of places around the country there have been uh, blockages for Muslim communities that wanted to build a mosque in their community. Uh, that's the kind of thing that particularly, I would say, as a Christian, the Christian majority should be at the absolute forefront of protecting the rights of everybody to worship freely in this country. And that's one of the ways to do that. Right here in Oklahoma, uh, we currently, right now, literally right now, have a legislator and a legislative body that is working actively to prevent any uh, non-Christians, essentially, from opening the legislative session in prayer. Uh, this is a change. It's blocking Muslims, it's mm -hmm. blocking uh, Jews and others, uh, and this isn't getting nearly enough attention, but it ought to be getting a lot of attention. Absolutely. It ought to be a real concern for all of us who believe in freedom of religion and freedom from government-imposed religion. So there are things, if you open your eyes, mm -hmm. that are happening, and particularly I speak to people who are in the majority community. Uh, having spent a lot of my life working in the Middle East, I know how much Christian minorities appreciate and cherish Muslims who protect their rights when they're in the minority, and it happens a lot, doesn't get a lot of attention, but it does happen a lot. So there are actually things that can be done like this if we're simply attentive. Mm -hmm. And there's also many um in particular Christian communities who have actually stepped up and opened their churches to undocumented people. 
And one of the reasons why religious institutions are so important is because there's some kind of um, maybe stature in the law that basically prevents law enforcement agencies from being able to kind of raid houses of worship. So if there, was a, if there is, and if your church is not yet, you might want to consider um, you know, becoming a sanctuary home for people who may be um, at risk of deportation or being picked up by ICE agents. And there's many, hundreds and hundreds across the country. This question connects uh, two more questions, and this one connects to the one, uh, what you just said, about 40 years down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a question about the next 10 years. How do you envision Muslim and non-Muslim coexistence in the next 10 years? Can you give us some hope to shorten that 40-year timeline down to 10 or 5 <laughs> or maybe November of this year? Uh, um, so hopefully I'll, be, I'll still be alive in 10 years. Pray for me. Um, I'm actually, the reason why I still do this work, by the way, is I'm just so, I'm like a hopeless optimist. Like, I believe that some good times are coming and they're coming really fast. And what I see, and I already see it, it's not like I envision it because I've already seen it in, in places all around the country. The, the coexistence is already there, right? The idea is that how do we make it the norm, right? How do we make anti-Muslim bigotry unacceptable? How do we make anti-immigrant sentiment unacceptable? How do we make homophobia and transphobia unacceptable? And that's really what it's about. But there are literally groups of people in solidarity across the country doing some really important work. 10 years from now, I believe we're gonna have a president that we deserve. I believe that we're gonna have you know, women all across the country in very powerful positions and women of color in powerful positions, and people of color in powerful positions. And the reason why I'm so optimistic and why I think that's the transformative change that we need is I truly believe that those closest to the pain are closest to the solution. And I challenge our country to put people who represent marginalized communities, to put women who have been fighting for centuries in this country for full equal rights in powerful positions, and I promise you that you will see transformative change in no time at all. So I see that. After the Women's March on Washington, over 20,000 women in this country have signed up to run for office, everywhere from the local level to the top of the ticket. And I know in 2018, this year, that's going to be the window into the next 10 years. And I promise you, we are going to win so big, bigly, in every part of this country. <laughs> and that is going to set us up, it's going to set us up for 2020. And I promise you that when we work together, when we put our common interests at the center, and all I'm asking you to do is put your children at the center, healthcare for, for all people. No one should die in our country because they don't have access to healthcare. Everybody should have access to higher education. No one in our country should have to work four jobs just to feed their families. These are the basic things, climate, like climate change. Like we cannot operate in a country that continues to ignore climate change around us. We won't even be around 10 years from now if we don't have a planet to live on. So at, we need to center these issues and work towards transforming these issues that are the most critical right now in our time. And that time is coming and it's coming fast and 10 years from now you're gonna remember this day and it's gonna be a wonderful day 10 years from now and we're gonna all be here when we said that time is coming. A change is gonna come and it's gonna come real quick. Fantastic. Just to show you how good Linda is, I was told we we're supposed to stop at 8.30. It's 8.29 and a half. And the, and the last question, she's so good, she actually answered the last question before I even could answer it. How do you maintain hope and determination in our divisive political climate? I think you just told us how. Please join me in thanking Thank Linda. Thank you. Thank so you, everyone. Much.